Rugby for me started, yeah, at Newland. You know, I could remember you know, my dad uh, uh, playing out here and used to come watch captains run, you know, and back then they still had the big water can on the side, you know, and they used to run around. And the, the scholar seats was in between the old standing seats, which is now seats, and, and the field, you know, there's a little slot where all of us sat in. And, um, you know, obviously game day, you know, you get those flashbacks. And back then you could still, straight after the game, get onto Newlands and play the biggest game of touch rugby ever you know so uh, this is where my f first memories of rugby happened and obviously tackling my my brother you know my brother's a year younger than me so he always wanted the ball and I always wanted to tackle back then. And that's where it all started so you know 2002 from a cricketer into a pro rugby player, and then the madness just continues. So 2003, played Vodacom Cup uh, for Western Province. Uh, after that, I was captain of the SA 21s uh, We were in Oxford and came back, played uh, five Curry Cup games uh, for Western Province under Carl Duplessis, and then got a phone call from Rudolf Strolli. He said, uh, wouldn't you come uh, join the Springbok, the national squad for the World Cup? And uh, went to uh, that squad um, assembly there started training with the guys and they obviously liked what they saw, played a couple of warm-up games and the next moment, you know, as a, as a 21-year-old, I went to the World Cup in 2003. So my first cap was actually a long, long build-up, you know, so we, we got together, I think, six weeks up in Pretoria and then after that we had another six weeks in, in Durban uh, before the World Cup. So it felt like I was in the squad for a long, long time. Um, then we went to the World Cup and I wasn't uh, involved in the first three weeks there. So it was like a three month build up where, you know, I just, I was waiting for the first game. And then I got uh, to Sydney, we were playing Georgia and uh, Rudolph said, I'm on the bench, you know, he wants to bring me early on the second half. And I was ready, you know, obviously before half time, I was warming up already. Then half time, straight after half time, you know, the jumper was off, I was ready to go on. And then Henro Skulls, who started ahead of me, actually got a yellow card. So then I had another 10 minutes to wait. That actually felt like a whole entire game. And then when you eventually get on, you know, beforehand you're quite nervous. You know, you, you know the anthem, it's the first time there. But as soon as you run on the field, the nerves just you know, disappears. And all you want is you want the ball in your hand, you want to make tackles, you want to contribute. Uh, so for me, once I got onto the field, you know, I just relaxed. And uh, at that stage, I had my whole family over there watching, so managed to score a try on a debut. Um, so unfortunately, not a lot of tries followed after that one. But uh, yeah, it's obviously a great moment. And afterwards, getting introduced as a Springbok, uh, you know, in the changing room. And by that stage, by a few legends who was around, some elderly statesmen was obviously a special moment. So a long process, um, how I got so ill. Uh, and so I'll take you back a few years. So 2011, the Springboks famous, famously lost against Australia in the quarterfinal, the Bryce Lawrence uh, game. Uh, at that stage, you know, again, I was playing rugby for quite a quite a long time. Went to the World Cup, one player, SA Rugby Player of the Year, 2011. Uh, so obviously, probably at the peak of my powers, 28 years old. Um, you know, you you go through stages in your career where you play and. The bigger risk you take, you know, the better you're playing. So you pretty much get to that fearless part and you, you almost like see yourself as a little bit, you know, invincible, you know. The bigger risk you take, you look at it afterwards and you go, yeah, I mean, that's a bit far out, but you get through them and you're playing better and better. Uh, so 2012, obviously, rearing to go for Super Rugby. Um, first game against the, the Hurricanes at Newlands, um, you know, basically just did my knee. You know, left knee, someone had me down the bottom. Conrad Smith came over the top, knee got stuck in the turf. And uh, basically took off all the ligaments and cartilage that keeps your, your patella back in place. So first we had a, quite a conservative approach by just having a scope and, you know, I did my medial ligament and just, you know, tightening up a little bit of everything. Um, and that didn't work. And so after that we had to have quite a, a drastic operation where we basically uh, you know, took um, where your patella enters the top of your shin and we took that whole thing off and moved it in just to get my alignment back. Um, so that was a success. So I started coming back training, but that was the whole year gone. So 2012 was back. So obviously started doing pre-season 2013. 
you know, now you're back, now you want to make a big impact, because at that stage, obviously, Heineken just took over, and it's a, it's a new regime with the spring box, and you want to be a part of it, and I think, you know, 2015 World Cup was still looming quite large in the back of my mind, and came back, and then, you know, just started getting weird sensations down my left leg, uh, you know, first it's my hammy, was a bit stiff, and then basically just settled in my calf. You know, my calf started playing up every time I did like two and a half or three k's of work. You know, it would cramp or maybe do a grade one or grade two. So eventually, we realised obviously the, the problem's not in my knee or it's not in my calf. It's coming out my back. And I went for a scan, and uh, that's where you know a whole new world opened. You know, so in the scan we basically discovered that there was a cyst that was compressing two thirds of my spinal cord, and that was what's calling the neural fallout um, down my left leg. Uh, the positive of discovering this cyst is that, you know, this thing was growing at quite a rapid rate and then one day I could have woken up paralyzed. Uh, so there was a positive to it. Uh, then the next step was to try and find out what this cyst consists of. And I had an exploratory operation where we drew some fluid from the cyst. And the good news was that the cyst was filled with um, spinal fluid. Um, so somewhere in my rugby career, I took a massive knock to my membrane, the dura that keeps your spinal cord intact, and that caused a little rupture. So my spinal fluid was just leaking out, filling the cyst. So after this exploratory operation, um, the bad news was that you know I got infection, and this infection stretched straight from the cyst into my spinal cord, contaminating my spinal fluid, and I had a form of bacterial meningitis. So I got operated on N1 City. Uh, my doctor was on leave, went straight back uh, to Somerset West, Vergelegen uh, Medic Clinic, and where it basically just, I just basically went from fine to flat in a bed, battling for every heartbeat. I mean, it's so difficult to explain to people. Probably the easiest is like every time your heart beats, someone's putting a knife straight through the middle of, of your head. And, and you could just feel yourself going, 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 and, and it was meningitis. And the, the battle was, obviously for me, was first of all the science was that I just had a normal spinal fluid leak. So with the operation, I had a normal spine, spinal fluid, so I got treated like that. And then after that, they found out, okay, but you can have meningitis. And then it was to find the right strand of infection. And um, as you know, with meningitis, you, can, you only got that long. Um, so mine carried on for five days. Um, so my eyes was closed. I was in a dark room. I was in isolation. Uh, I can't remember much of it. I can just remember that I was there. Uh, I was never really gone. Um, but I, I, I hardly really spoke through those few days. I had a few friends visiting. And I think after the third, third day in hospital, I think my missus phoned a couple of good mates and say, listen, I think this is it. This is probably probably the last day we'll have with this bloke. I mean, it doesn't look, if he doesn't come right today, day four and five doesn't look too rosy. Anyway, eventually uh, managed to get the right strand of infection, got me on the right meds and I recovered and, and started feeling better quickly. Uh, so that was the scariest part was done. Uh, but for me now, obviously still in hospital, the next phase was, you know, how do you get rid of the cyst? Because the cyst, the problem is, you know, there's been some complications, but the problem is still there. And then the next process started. Um, so then another four operations after that to carefully take away the cyst. Uh, and the cyst was quite large, so it's quite, quite long. Uh, and because it was pushing on this, um, on my... Um, Dura that keeps the spinal cord together, that was sort of porous. It was quite a tricky operation. And I remember, like, you know, go in for the one and you think, okay, this is it, you know, I'm fixed up. And you come out and the doctor's look on the face, says everything, says, partner, sorry, we've got one more. So I went in for the second one, same look, third one. And eventually, you know, we, we got it all sorted. Um, a long process. You know, I was in hospital for four months. Got out and obviously, you know, the body was completely out of tune by then. You know, obviously I lost so, lost so much spinal fluid. Uh, at one stage we were pulling um, a lot of spinal fluid out to keep everything nice and, and easy. So there wasn't a lot of pressure on the dura. Uh, so then at another two months in bed, um, just basically lying, not 
being able to get up, only getting up to go to the bathroom or shower or brush your teeth. Um, uh, then went for a checkup and went to the doctor um, and said, listen here, partner, am I right? And he said, you're all good. And I was quite cheeky. I said, is there a possibility that I can play rugby again? And he said, yeah, you can, um, but you'll never be Skullberg again. So I said, no, I can is, is good enough. And then it took me another two months to convince my wife, you know, because a massive fright at that stage that he only had one kid, uh, but still young, he was six months, six months old. So it was a scary time. And eventually I convinced her and you went back to Western Province because, you know, that's what you know. You go train there and you start getting fit. But for me, it was basically a process from starting walking. You know? Let's walk three Ks, you know, and see how you, how you feel afterwards. And it started getting back, so walking three k's, walking over the mountain, to the side of the mountain, to Table Mountain, and then started running. And funnily enough, like I was, I lost quite a lot of weight. I, I think I lost 18 kilograms during this whole process. But the running fitness and the aerobic part of it came back quite quickly. But then, as soon as I started training rugby, I mean, you realise that you've got a, what you took for granted, like tackling and getting involved in a mall and wrestling. Yeah, you, know, you did that, you know. That was your bread and butter. Now, obviously coming back, you've lost all that base of strength. So it took me so much more effort to tackle a bloke or to wrestle a guy. And that was a challenge for me is, you know, trying to get back as quickly as I could. And that, if you look back now, I think that took, you know, just the physical part to get back to where I was or close to where I was, probably took about eight months before I got, I played a game and I thought, okay, you know, I manhandled this bloke. And that was easy, you know, and this was easier. And falling, jumping up and down, it feels natural now. You know, for me, I've always been a patient guy, but it's never easy. You know, as I mentioned earlier, when something gets taken away from you, that's when you miss it even more. You know, when you go out on your terms, I think you've had time and you've thought about the process of how you're going to go about this. Um, so the first thing I, is got to make peace with it. You know, there's no, there's no quick fix. You know, this is a long-term plan. Um, so for me, the, the first one was, yes, I've got to get healthy again. Then second was, okay, how do we fix getting rid of the cyst? And then the next thing is a process. And where it gets difficult is where you start running out of patience. Because all of us, you know, it's easy to wake up every morning, pitch up to play a game on a Saturday and play. But it's so tough to wake up to do another mindless fitness session or you know, a gym session or a rehab session. And that's where we've got to be patient. And you get back and you, you're obviously hard on yourself because you put in all this hard work and you play your first game or your second game and you're a bit inconsistent because you want the graph to do this. Uh, but the graph doesn't, you know, it goes down, it goes, then you feel a little bit better, stronger, fitter. Then you go through a couple of weeks where you're battling, you know. Um, and it, I think the big key is, especially with me, as I came back and there was a big reputation before it, before I got ill. And, and the problem was coming back now, I still was measured against what I was before what I what got, went through. Yeah. And, and the public didn't really care at that stage what I was coming through or coming back was achievement. They wanted me to be there. You know, they wanted me to compete against myself. And I think in the back of mind, I was too. Um, and, and I think the challenge was to do, be patient enough and believe enough in your own ability that you're going to get there. Because I think there was a couple of games where you play and you think, I'm not too sure if I'm going to get there. And then you know, after games, you sit at home and you have a couple of beers with your missus and you think, I'm not sure I'm going to get there. And then you just got to go back to your roots. You know, why do you play rugby? One is enjoyment. I've always enjoyed it. I play it for my teammates and I play it for my family. And, you know, as confidence comes back and you start playing a little bit better, you, you start seeing, okay, we're edging closer. And I think I got to a point last year where I was playing as well as I've ever played. Um, so uh, it's, it's a long process, you know, so from 2012 to 2015, it's, it's three years it took me where I felt, okay, I'm very close to where I was at the peak of my powers, but it was a great journey. You know, the key to my success was obviously, yes, I had a very good support system around me, my friends, family, especially my wife. Uh, but secondly, you know, I was patient with the whole process and, 
And at the end of, in the back of my mind, there was always the World Cup, you know, 2015, you know. Because I had two years out, there was, there was a burning desire that, you know, that's where I want to be. And, and I want to be a major role player in that World Cup, you know. For me, you know, I got a taste. Heineke gave me an opportunity to play for the box uh, in 2014, you know, on the bench. I got one start uh, that whole year and I was man of the matchup in, in Twickenham. Yeah, and that sort of just triggered it. You're like, okay, you know, I, I want to push for a starting spot. And I think 2015, you know, yeah, I started every single test match. Uh, 2015 uh, with the World Cup, you know, it's for me, it's a nice process. You know, even though you know us as a team, you know, we we run on fire, we came third. I think even at that World Cup, you know, the way we turned things around from Japan, I think for me, I'd, you know, my life sort of had a lot in common with that. You know, it might not have been perfect. Uh, but we got to a, a decent result in there.